Thank you, everybody, for joining the talk today. Can everybody hear me okay? Mic's working? Okay. If you'd like to follow along, there's a QR code there, which will take you to the, to the repo. Quickly, a little bit about myself. Uh, Piero Peralte, I'm a senior principal data scientist at CDSL. Um, some of the other stuff was mentioned earlier, so we can keep it moving. I'd like to hear a little bit about you, though. Who in this room, by show of hands, works with data? Okay, pretty broad question. Who runs queries? Okay, so we lost a few, but still the majority of you. Who engineers features? All right. Who trains ML models? All right, so it's dying down a little bit. Who deploys models to production? All right, even fewer. Who here has felt the pain with all of these things? All right, all of us. So a disclaimer about this talk, I'm not going to be going into any bleeding edge, deep learning frameworks. We won't be talking WASM. We won't be talking blockchain. We won't be talking computing on the edge. However, we will be talking about something that I think is pretty near and dear to all of our hearts, uh, saving a whole lot of time when we have to go through that cumbersome and tedious process of data collection and feature engineering. So if we can do this exercise together, everybody uh, close your eyes, okay? Close your eyes and imagine that you are a new employee at NUCO, and your boss approaches you with your first project. And he or she says, okay, I need this, I need you to build this churn model for me, okay? And I need it by tomorrow, uh-oh, right? You're this brand new employee. You know absolutely nothing about the data landscape. Databases over here, cloud warehouse over there, distributed file system over here. What are you to do? This can be characterized as a cold start problem. Show of hands, is anybody familiar with this term, a uh, cold start problem with like rec systems? Okay, a few of you. So the cold start problem emerges when we need to have, uh, a rec system needs to have a perspective on what to recommend to you. But it doesn't know anything about you because you're brand new. It doesn't know all of your you know, tastes and preferences from a, a long history. And so this is kind of a cold start problem for the data scientists because they don't know the data. So how are they to start modeling if they don't know the data? Pop quiz, what should you do? A, hunker down, it's gonna be a long night. B, fake it till you make it. C, make a scene and rage quit. <laughs> or D, other. To each their own, but the correct answer is D, other. And my tip to all of you, uh, especially managers or anybody thinking about data infrastructure, is to not put your colleagues in this position in the first place. And how can we do that? Good question. Okay, I know it's a little hand wavy to say we can make things better, but let's unpack that a little bit. Let's talk about it. Here we have a spectrum. And on, the, on your left-hand side, it's starting from scratch, right? Pure play, cold start problem. And on the opposite end of the spectrum, we have a, a full-fledged feature store. I have all the magical features that are very informative and they're at my fingertips. I can get them in milliseconds, right? Perfect world. Okay? But we know as technologists, as developers, that there are trade-offs. And to achieve that low, low latency, it's gonna come at a cost. You have to pay the piper at some point. That cost can be you know, what you're actually paying for that expensive caching, or it can also be the, the dev costs that, that come with developing a feature store. So let's try to move somewhere up the spectrum, but you know, without going to the, to the total right. So we have some queries under version control. That's good, that's a start. Right? I can take those queries out of different disparate repos and I can start running them. Not great, because I need to do a little hunting and pecking. Um, it still assumes that I'm going to submit those queries the old fashioned way, uh, one after another, serially, but we can do better, right? And that's where Cold Start lives. Cold Start lives in that space where there is a, a collection of curated queries and it's doing some magical things behind the scenes to ensure that when you are running those queries, you're getting your data back as soon as possible and it is primed for modeling. Remember this slide from yesterday, Thomas Castle? Same idea here. 
I don't want to, uh, you know, beat this one to a pulp, but it's uh, it, it holds true. All right, let's let's get into a couple couple more things here. So cold storage is really built around this powerful class called Feature Factory, and if you're used, if you're starting to use uh, cold start, you you want to know what queries are in my query bank, right? Um, it has some convenience methods that allow you to list dialects, uh, which which databases are supported, BigQuery, Redshift, Postgres, whatever it is. Then any one of those dialects will have entities associated with them. Uh, so coming from the healthcare domain, an entity in our world might be like a provider ID for a doctor or a member ID for a member, or a prospect ID for somebody who's not quite yet, not a member quite yet. Those are some examples of, of entities. An entity may have one or many domains associated with it. So if we think about a member entity, maybe we're interested in their historical medical utilization as a domain, or perhaps um, social determinants of health, for example, or benefit utilization. Those are just examples. And then a domain may have one or many queries associated with it. So by establishing this relationship, I can go in as a new user and say, I'm going to be working. Uh, I'd like to know which queries are available. OK, I see that the, the BigQuery has some queries with it. And it has these 10 domains associated with it. I don't necessarily have to know every single query or every line of code um, that that tries those queries, but I can see from a 30,000 foot view, okay, thematically, these are the 10 chunks or 10 domains or categories of features that I'll be pulling into my model. Uh, we'll look at some examples later of how we do this, but uh, suffice it to say that in order to achieve this, we have to enforce some opinionated patterns about how the queries are, writ are written so that they can be dynamically templated at runtime. Those queries are then, uh, concurrently executed. Uh, there are mechanisms in place to ensure row-level consistency. We create composite keys on the fly for you. And also, because this, uh, this is a package for data scientists primarily, has anybody in here ever um, leaked data into a model? Right? It's, it's the accidental thing where you know, you're going to make a prediction and you are the model is seeing some data that would not, or you're training a uh, model and uh, you're feeding in data that would not have been observable at the point in time when you would like to make that prediction. So cold start helps kind of prevent this problem. It's also memory friendly. It does some things like intelligent downcasting if you instruct it to, and you can even return out of core data structures. When you're ready to go to production, it will freeze these queries so that you're running the same query template um, dynamically, which will dynamically get templated at runtime when you're ready to go to prod. And it's also customizable in that you can uh, inf you can set an instruction to create mini batches or even you know uh, retry. So we kind of talked through this flow uh, a little bit, but you start feature factory, it stages the leftmost table. Everything uh, after start feature factory, by the way, is happening behind the scenes for you, okay? So you stage the leftmost table, it then parses and collects queries. It will then freeze those queries for a production run if you instruct it to. It templates the queries, it runs them concurrently, it collects some metadata about all those, all those results that it just created because it needs that metadata to then dynamically build this big left merge or left join query. Right? So if I had 20 queries that had 100 features each getting returned, it needs to dynamically build that query so that it can then run that last query so you can get back to your nice wide data frame. Then it will drop the intermediate tables, do some cleanup for you, and ultimately return your data frame that is ready to go right into a scikit pipeline or whatever the uh, ML library du jour is. Quick question. Let's do questions at the end, please. So this is what uh, an example query might look like. Uh, first off, we have to name it. Um, the tip here is to name the query in a way that uh, is somewhat indicative of what it is. And that helps later on because when, uh, when the result returns, it actually prepends the query name to the feature name so that you can maintain some semblance of data lineage. Because maybe you need to get back a data frame with you know, 5,000 features in it. You might want to know where exactly it came from. 
So that allows you to make the association back to the query. The queries need to be tagged. Um, these three tags are really important. The dialect, the entity, and the domain. And you tag it just like you would add in a note uh, or comment, rather, in one of your queries. Then you'll notice over here this leftmost query um, in the first CTD. That's really important. That's where your stage table gets dynamically templated at runtime, and then it subsequently constrains any, uh, any later CTDs. Uh, then in the where clause, there's a min date and a max date that gets applied. In the staging table, it, it has the min and max state that either you are spec that you're specifying. So then you would any other tables that are part of that query that need to be date constrained, you would then reference the uh, mid date and max date. And lastly, if you look at the outermost query there, uh, you'll notice that we're grouping by this this IDX. That's the composite key that I referenced before, which is essentially a concatenation of your entity ID, the min date, and a max date. So this does a lot of stuff for you. Um, there are a lot of benefits and a lot of time being saved so far, but it's not, you still need to, to give it the instruction, what are you trying to model? What are you trying to do? But it doesn't ask that much of you. All it wants is for you to define a table that has your entity ID and your dependent variable, call it Y. You also have the option, for example, if you're uh, you know, working with journal data where you have the same member ID that is showing up multiple observations or just different time periods. You can add in the min and the max state so that you, know, you're, you're, you have multiple observations for a given entity ID. That is also acceptable. So that's pretty much it. Um, that's not a whole lot to ask of an end user. So um, all that's good, all that's well but now it's time to actually see it in action. I would like to convince each one of you that this is really, really easy to use, and it's a great intermediate solution to this cold start problem. So let me cut over to a notebook. Um, and by the way, the, this quick start notebook can be found in, in the repo. Um, for those of you that used the QR code before, if you just want to jump into examples, you can, you can find it right there. All right, so this is just a little bit of a reiteration of what we said before. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and pip install cold start here. Make this just a little bit bigger. All right. And now we'll just restart our kernel. We'll do some uh, obligatory imports. Identify as MP and as PD. Okay, all pretty good so far. All right, now this is the, the first piece that I mentioned where we're going to inspect the query bank. Right now I have some test queries in there. Um, and the only dialect that is applicable right now is BigQuery. So now I know, okay, in the query bank, I have some queries presumably from, from this warehouse or from this database. All right, let's then take BigQuery and pass it into list entities. Now I need to know what entities do I have queries associated with. All right, so I see we have a team ID and a game ID. I used um, a public data set in BigQuery for NCAA basketball, um, so that's why we, we have those entities. Now I'm going to pass uh, the dialect in the team ID that I'm interested in, or the team ID rather, into this list domains. Okay, we get back, we get back a couple of domains. Uh, so we have a domain for mascot, for wins, for losses, for venue, for taxonomy. And then lastly, we can also see which individual queries are available. Right now there's there's just five in there, but you can have um, at uh, at CDS Health we have, I think, close to 40 different queries in the in the query bank that we're using that ultimately return, you know, thousands of features. Um, so you typically wouldn't need to use that list queries method unless you had already gone through this exercise and you realized, oh, well, I, I first explored these domains with these queries, but they weren't terribly informative, or maybe they're not applicable for the type of modeling problem that I'm trying to solve. So you could zero in on specific queries as well. All right, 
So now we're just going to go ahead and define our uh, leftmost table. And in this case, what we're doing is um, basically saying, you know, did this team in the 2016 year have a winning or losing season? Was there, was their win percentage greater than or less than 50%? And we're going to use the, the prior five years to see if we can predict that based on some of these test queries that we have. So I'm going to go ahead and run this. Run this. We'll look at our, our class imbalance in just a moment here. Okay. So we have a pretty nice, you know, it never looks that good in, a, in our world. It's always like a crazy imbalance, but, but that's pretty, pretty good. Okay. So now we need to, uh, we're going to start using feature factory. And all it wants from you is, is some instructions about which dialect do I need to use and some other um, you know, arguments depending on, because this is actually using SQL Alchemy to start an engine behind the scenes and different, different dialects have different inputs that are necessary to build that connection string. Um, and this is a really flexible dictionary. So like if you're using you know, another, another database or something that requires additional arguments, it's extensible that way. So I'm going to go ahead and run it, and it's going to start the engine. The engine has been started. And oh, we're just calling help there on, on the feature factory class, but um, we can go ahead and run it. All right, so now, now this is where the fun starts. All we've done is defined our leftmost table, that same table that I just showed you before, and we're specifying where we want all these results to go. And they don't have to go anywhere. You could just return a data frame and uh, you know work with it, but let's say for um, you know memorialization purposes, or you know we want to version all the training data sets that we're working with, you write it out to a target table. So note that most of these are defaults. And if we look at, for example, the uh, the readme, most of the most of the time, all you need to do is pass in these five arguments, right? Uh, Leftmost table, feature table, FBID domains. But here, you know, I'm just showing you the others, uh, so it's it's clear what else you can do with uh, with Feature Factory. But I'm going to go ahead and run that. And so what it's doing right now is staging that leftmost table. Then it's going to template and execute those queries concurrently. All right. So we ran all five queries. They were all successful. If one of them happened to fail, it would have let me know. Okay, and it would have kept going. Uh, you could make it so that if any one query fails, it just you know, throws its arms up in the air and it stops. So we finished. We ran all five queries, and now we are interested in doing some modeling, right? So we can call this get data frame method on feature factory, which will return features to app for us. And then we're just going to move that IDX column to our index. And now we have a nice clean data set, right? We have a clean data set with all of these wonderful features. And this is ready to go for modeling. All I need to do from, from there, I can also check out the, uh, the table name, by the way. Um, now, just to confirm that the, that cold start wrote these features out to the feature table, we can go ahead and, and query it. Uh, so we're passing in the table name that was just returned uh, from it into, into this mm -hmm. query. Okay, so great. It did what it was supposed to do. It gave us back our data frame, and it also preserved these features uh, in that in that table. So, show of hands, who in the room has worked with um, <coughs> sklearn pipelines? They're great, right? And uh, and column transformers were were a game changer. Uh, and you can do things like, you know, create your numeric transformer, your categorical transformer, and then push them into uh, one pipeline, and you can do things like, you know, dtype include number or dtype include categorical data type, so that you know, now I have a pretty smart pipeline in just a couple lines of code. I would consider this like the most basic of basic pipelines, but it's extremely generalizable. This is the kind of code I would want somebody who's brand new building their first model to start using and then build upon, right? They can add in all sorts of different steps and feature transformations within their pipeline. Um, but remember our features, yeah? All we're doing is saying, hey, that first column, that's your Y. Everything else, have fun X. So we have created our pipeline. We fit it. 
And now we have this helper function here to evaluate how the model did. I didn't say it was going to be a good model, okay? Uh, because this is NCAA win percentages. We know that there is all sorts of magic that happens in, uh, in, in the tournament. Um, but hopefully the point that comes across is that wasn't very hard. Essentially, all I had to do was specify a couple tables, a date range, call this feature factory thing, and then I'm ready to go. And my pipeline, my, my code doesn't have to change that much. I can still be using a TensorFlow pipeline, I can still be using a scikit pipeline, whatever it is. Just the way that we're going about getting these features is now condensed, and we're doing a lot more work in a, in a shorter period of time. So, in conclusion, cold start dramatically accelerates the modeling process. Your, your time to value, your productivity, especially for, for new folks. I had this idea in my head that, that this library would be really useful, especially for, for new employees. But then what I found out in talking to colleagues was that they started using it for general exploratory data analysis. And because you know having this, this wide data frame of data can be uh, useful in other contexts as well. It encourages collaboration and peer-reviewed reusable queries. That one is super important. Um, what a shame it would be if all of us rewrote the same query or rewrote the same code 20 times over, and we didn't stand to benefit from peer reviewing one version and making that one version really great, while the rest of us worked on creating additional queries that were then subsequently peer reviewed. This library emphasizes approachability and usability. Want to make it really easy. Um, you know, show of hands, who believes this is something that would be relatively trivial to incorporate into your daily workflow? Pip install and then instantiate feature factory. Anyone? Okay, a couple of you. So maybe I haven't, haven't convinced everyone and if you, if you need additional convincing, I would say pip install it and then check out the quick start. Uh, cold start also abstracts away efficient design patterns. You know, using CTE is avoiding, avoiding data leakage, etc. And it's extensible in that you can support additional dialects, add additional queries. So if these are some of the types of things that you're interested in, then cold start might be, might be good for you. So where are we going from here? A um, couple, couple things is pretty hot off the presses, added to IPI uh, about two days ago. Um, we want to add a switch, or instead of writing to intermediate tables that then get dropped, um, you know, just write parquet files out to, out to your bucket. Um, so that might be another option. Uh, the option to return uh, different types of data frames, um, maybe like a Polar's data frame or something like that. We, uh, some of us may have attended the Polar's talk yesterday. Um, testing for more databases and adding um, uh, some retrying decorators from Tenacity to some of the queries to make them even more durable. Uh, maybe you retry you know, three or four times or stop after 60 seconds or whatever it is. So that's it. I uh, want to thank you for being uh, out. Appreciate it. And now I'd like to take any questions that you may have. I believe you had. Yeah, actually, I'll ask a different one because you did answer the one that I had. So okay. it was right to defer to the end. Um, so when you do this kind of joint path style feature engineering, um, often you don't have a one-to-one -one relationship, and that's why you have these left joints. Um, but then you need some kind of aggregation. Um, and I couldn't quite figure out in the talk who picks what to aggregate and how to aggregate. I mean, uh, is it somehow magically in the library that the user specify it? So if we look at this example here, the outermost query will always group by the index. And the final join, um, you know, joins on that index. It's, it's an inner join to all of these future tables. So you are guaranteed that the table that comes out with the final, the final big live table with all of your queries, it's guaranteed to have the same number of observations as the input table that you specified, so long as this pattern is being observed. I guess maybe it would be simplify the question. Who writes that query on the right? the individuals that are contributing to the library. So say you know this domain ABC particularly well. Maybe you add those queries 
to the query bank. Maybe your colleague knows another complementary domain and he or she adds those. Thank you. Yes? Uh, could you go back to the slide with the emojis on it? Um, yeah. That one? Okay. So when you say medium latency, can you uh, add a little bit more color on what that means? Yeah, it is a little bit reductive, but essentially we are, it's, it's happening at runtime, right? So with a feature store, you know, part of the premium that you're paying is for, you're, you're specifying a schedule, I want these queries to refresh every 10 seconds or every minute or something. And then you're having to pay for this like really, you know, fast cash, right? So that those, those queries are ready to go when you need them. Um, you know, cold start, things are happening at runtime, albeit in as parallelizable of a way as possible. Assuming the query already No, they actually execute at runtime. Okay. So okay. when we. I'm just thinking about, like, you know, when in the flowchart where you mentioned merging, that's typically depending on how large the query can be computationally expensive and cause low latency. So that's, that's kind of what's motivating the question of understanding, putting a higher point on what you mean latency. So, yeah, I'm using, I'm using latency kind of generally there, mm -hmm. right? I'm just saying, like, essentially the time that it'll take you to have features ready as well. I'm considering that latency in this kind of reductive context. Um, but yes, those queries are, are run at runtime. time. And let's say you have uh, you know, 15 queries that you're submitting. Mm -hmm. One takes one minute and another one takes two minutes. Uh, it's the longest one in query. You're going to have to wait at least two minutes right, for, those, for those features or for those feature queries to finish running. Oh, you say latency is using, it's been used interchangeably with velocity and delivery of work? Potato, potato. Um, yeah, I, I kind of called it time to features here, right. but uh, essentially it's just, I'm a data scientist. I really want to start modeling right now. How much, how long do I have to wait until I can start doing that? Well, I have a farland question. Mm -hmm. um, let's say that I want to create a database for a certain application or like some there be any possibility for me to use this uh, to somehow model that? Or is it only for queries and testing out what a particular you know, pre existing database is and you know, what its properties are? <coughs> yeah, I, I wouldn't, you know, try to, I wouldn't try to like shove it through, shove a circle, the circular peg through a square hole on this one. It's really assuming that you have like a database or a warehouse out there and you have, you're extracting features from it. Um, and you just want to kind of build up this, this library of queries uh, following this pattern so that you can stand to benefit from, you know, uh, accelerated model development. But not, yeah, that's, that's kind of out of scope for this particular project. Uh, so latency is like duration or time. So low latency means it's happening fast and high latency means it's taking a long time. Am I, am I right on that? Correct. <coughs> I think there was another question over here. Hey, thanks, uh, thank you. thanks for the lovely uh, talk. I have one question. You talked about the three queries, right? Queries which can be accomplished by the domain owner or whoever on a type of people about that specific uh, industry. So let's say we have a very big data set and it's like running into terabytes or some few tables which are very you know, packed tables. So is it possible to have that some data in a view and then we can refer that in this uh, code stack library? You could target a, a view, a materialized view, a table in, in the queries. It doesn't it doesn't actually care what that is. If it were a materialized view, it would just go that much faster. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's not picky about how that, that that is actually in your in your database. I think there was another question right behind. Okay. Yes. Where is the query bank, and where do I put all the queries? In? Is there ever a situation where, say, one team in the company says, we put all our queries in this one bucket, and, and another team puts them all on Dropbox? You know, do you need to get everybody together to put them in one monolithic system? You can. I, I wanted to create a little bit of flexibility here. The, so the query bank, by default, lives within the cold start directory. So like, if you went ahead and you you could install the package, you could add them in there. I know sometimes it's kind of hard to like find that. But that's also why we have a um, just jump to the right thing here. There is 
a parameter for the query directory. So let's say it's in your home directory or it's some other repo that somebody has to clone and it's just a collection of these. You can point to it. So that much is portable, but um, you know you, you can certainly add them to the, to the default location if you're interested in doing so. Yes? So um, just kind of piggybacking off that question, I guess the right way for an organization to adopt it would be to fork this library and then develop our own proprietary query bank, and you would version control it like basically the same way any other software you would version control. I think so. That's kind. Of, that's the way that we've been doing it internally at, at CBS Health, um, just because I, I like having the things close together, right? But it doesn't force you to do that. You can certainly, you know, have an adjacent repo or you know maybe um, like a share drive or something where everybody adds their their queries. That much is flexible, but yeah, I think the pattern that you outline with forking and then adding your your uh, queries to the query bank directly is probably the easiest or lowest overhead pattern. So, sorry, a follow up question to that. So, um, if we did that, then we wouldn't have to like adhere to the. I mean, it seems like a lot of this is based off of CBS's like internal design patterns in their query engine database. No, that, that much has been abstracted away. This is completely agnostic to anything at my company or your company. Um, you know, you can target any database or warehouse that SQL Alchemy is capable of connecting to, and you can drop in any queries that are associated with your target. All right, well, just want to thank everybody again uh, for the opportunity. If you're interested in cloning the repo, check it out or just hit install it. If you're interested in uh, career opportunities at CBS Health, we're hiring quite a bit. So please check out our careers page. Thank you all so much.